Hey there, I'm just uh, taking a couple minutes here to do a few minutes of examination on something that really kind of hit me recently. Um, I guess like most people in the United States, uh, I've changed jobs recently in the last 10 years a few times and and I'm in the middle of a job change right now, let's put it that way. And um, so I'm going through some, you know, introspection and all that kind of stuff and trying to figure out, you know, what I'm going to put in my resume for my last job and what I'm going to do as far as uh, talking about my skills and my abilities and how I relate um, as far as technology goes and what I can offer companies and so forth in the future and all that good stuff. And it's always been a challenge for me to do this because I like to say that I have X amount of experience in this and experience in that and experience in this, but I'm also pretty good at learning new technologies and, and, adapt, and adapting to uh, the need for new technologies when, it, when addressing problems. I mean, it's one of the things that you do as a college educated person is you walk into a situation with limited knowledge of the subject at best and you learn you're forced to learn at a high rate of speed some very technically uh, challenging you know subject matter master it and, and you know that's what you do when you pass a college class so what you do when you pass any kind of class really you it depends on the, the pace of instruction and the, the complexity of the, of the subject matter but basically every student does this every student walks into a situation learns you know, some new material at a pace that's dictated by um, the, the class instructor, the, the school curriculum, and also, you know, the other students in the class. And you're at a certain amount of time, which is no more than three months, let's say, you know, often shorter for summer classes. It's only, you know, 12 weeks or, or something, you know, you're, you're tested on this material and you expect it to, to know and to have a good understanding of some very complicated material. What I found throughout my career is there's always somebody who tries to say that that's not possible, you can't do that. And there's always somebody who's happy to take your experience, like you might have you know, 12 years experience working on something, and then you go out and you, you do something different for three years and they'll go back and they'll say, and when you go out and you look for you know, a job and you start talking about your, your experience in your previous position, there's always somebody. And believe me, always there's gonna be the, the person, you know, not just a man and also a woman, there's always there's gonna be a person who says, oh, but that was three years ago, you don't remember anything. It's been three years since you've done that, like you've forgotten how to do it, okay? And there'd be something that you've done for 10, 15, 20 years even of your life this person who barely knows you is going to suddenly invalidate your ability in that area. You know, they for some reason, they only want to believe that you can do it if you've been consistently doing it. And then there are all the people who want to believe that you can do it or can't do something if you've been doing it professionally, right? Remember, remember that? Like, oh, you know, I, I've done this on my own. Doesn't matter, you know. Did you do it for a job? You know, if you didn't do it for a job, remember that all the times when they would say you didn't do it for a job, that it didn't matter. Now it's because now we have people who are doing things, um, projects, working in projects on side jobs or, you know, in their spare time, or, or they've got working for a startup or anything where it's not like a, it's a large established company. You know, there, there was the period of time when they would just dismiss that. Okay. Oh, it wasn't for a real job. It doesn't matter. You know, now that we have all these startups and people have taken, you know, ideas from a garage and, and, and turned them into billion dollar ideas, all of a sudden now it's okay to have worked for a startup or worked for an online collaboration or something like that, or even as a consultant or a freelancer. Now you've got people actually looking for someone like that. But in any case, here's one thing that I've learned, okay? I've learned this without question. There is always going to be someone out there who looks at you and demeans you for some reason or another because you don't match what they consider to be a valuable person in some way or form, okay? And I, I don't see how anyone who has just heard what I had to say cannot listen to what the rhetoric is coming out of the alt-right and out of Richard Spencer's mouth. But here's my problem. 
to be fair, to be honest, okay, the guy has a master's degree in American history, as I understand it, from a reputable East Coast college, not, you know, Oral Roberts University or something like that, or Texas Christian, you know, whatever, okay, but, you know, North Carolina State or some, some major ACC or, you know, college, and as as I do, I don't have a master's, but I have a, a bachelor's in wildly different areas. And I think that we have to, you know, we can't just, you know, summarily dismiss him because he's some off the wall racist or some off the wall bigot. He's an educated racist, an educated bigot, but I'm not really sure. And this is the problem I have with Spencer. I'm not really sure exactly what his game is, what his, what his argument is that is new or different or maybe it's just a different spin on an old argument which i suspect is what it is because i've i've had patiently and through some effort actually listen to at least some of what he has to say or what he's said that's been recorded and put on youtube this is in contrast and i admit this in complete contrast to craig ferguson bill burr uh, Louis C.K., uh, Dennis Chappelle, uh, David Chappelle, some other comedians, some of the other comedians, you know, that I see, you know, guys that are, and even, you know, women comedians, women writers, women authors, you know, women and male, I would say, Hollywood um, actors and actresses and, and comedians and speech writers and writers and so forth and so on, from people who are as liberal as Chelsea Handler to people who is quote unquote conservative as New York times. You, you see in my, a lot of my videos, I referenced the New York times. I think the New York times has a certain simplicity to it that lends to reading their articles. They're always, you know, a borderline catastrophe in their stories. And then I realized over time, after reading their articles for a long, long, long time, when I realized I just can only handle so much of their hypot of their um, hyperbole. We're taking everything and turning it into a huge catastrophe. I don't know if it's to get clicks. I don't know if it's a New York style or whatever, but there's something about the whole New York mentality of always taking every little thing that happens and just make it this huge, you know, it's terrible. It's traumatizing. It's, it's terrorizing. You know, it's, 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 um, you know, the Yankees, the giants, you know, it's one thing to talk about sports and to bring this hyper hyperbole into it. But when you talk about you know street crime or or politics or um, social activities and everything has to have this hyperbole attached to it, it really does get old and tiring. You know, you know that's not the case. It's just not as bad as they're trying to make it out. But like everything happens, and it's this huge catastrophe with coming out of the New York Times. So I've really had to kind of dial it back a little bit. And there's some there's some bad stories in it certainly. But there's just too much in hyperbole in the reporting and the write-ups and certainly the commentary that I see in the Times. Okay, so that's one thing. So the Times, to me, epitomizes a lot of New York politicians and um, commercial interests, okay? Like Donald Trump, like Barbara Walters, like uh, de Blasio. And, and when you see all these people talking about each other and talking about New York politics and state politics and... New York City politics, state politics, and, and federal politics, and global politics, and everything, it's, you kind of see this pattern, this trend of New Yorkers blowing everything up into this huge problem. Every, everything has to become a huge problem for them. They, they have to magnify the situation to be the worst it possibly can be, or as, as terrorism, as, as, as terroristic as it possibly could be, right? And I'm not going to deny that some of them, some of these events are actually bad events. So, you know, getting slashed in the subway is not something, it is a major issue with all these people slashing people in the subways and all these people, you know, robbing 81-year-old women and so forth and, and stuff. And you know, it, 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 there's no question about that. But if the Giants lose a football game, you know, it's not the end of the season. I don't care you know, if they lose five games, it's not the end of the season. If the Yankees lose the baseball game, you know, because the pitcher made a mistake on a, a play to home plate, it, it, he didn't, you know, destroy the Yankee season. And there's, you, you see this somewhere in the middle between the two. And when you cover enough topics from one topic to another, you realize, you know, they're basically doing it to everything. So the thing is, 
when I read news now, I'm a little bit more sensitized to hyperbole than I used to be and a little bit desensitized to it in a sense that I don't have to argue about it or investigate it or read it, you know, as much as I used to. And so when I see this thing about Harvey Weinstein and all the stuff that people are talking about Weinstein, and he's far from the first guy like this who has been a sexual predator, you know, all his career, gone through his career, his long career, and finally being spit out by Hollywood at the end of it, right? All these women are coming out with all these accusations about him, whereas, you know, and, and I think this is exactly the point. Half of the accusations are accusations that could have been made a long time ago, but they weren't. And that's part of the reason why he still was in, in power. You know, a large part of the reason why, you know, Bill O'Reilly and, and Roger Ailes, Ailes, sorry, that these guys remain in power is because women did not come forward with credible accusations against them. Yet, every fifth person at least knew what this guy was all about. And the enablers, the agents, the associates, you know, the people who worked under him, who were all worried about losing their jobs, if they had come out and talked to him, or he could grab a woman by the arm and say, if you ever tell anyone about what happened to this, your whole career would be ruined and I'll basically drag you in her bus and flush you down the toilet. You know, I mean, seriously. Now Barbara Walters is getting this heat for responding to what Corey Feldman said on, her, on, the, on the View back 20 years ago or whatever, you know, and he said, you know, hey, I, if, if I could come out and say something without having to worry about libel laws, it would be to talk about the pedophilia that's rampant in Hollywood. And she says, oh, you're, you're just damaging the entire industry. And it was her immediate response was to leap on him with this hyperbole, okay, in defense of the entire industry, whatever that actually meant, you know, and you, you just get tired of it. At some point, you get tired of dealing with this wide, whitewash, hyperbole, nonsense bullshit, okay? So Spencer has been somebody who's been harder for me to read and listen to, not easier over time. Because to me, Spencer is another guy out there just going off the rails, talking nonsense, okay? And he's offensive to me as an academic. He's offensive to me in a number of other ways. And I just can't see how people take him seriously, but a lot of people do. And, I, and it occurred to me, it really did occur to me, when I realized how easy it is to listen to somebody like Craig Ferguson do a show, and I mean, you know, he's one of my favorite comedians, one of my favorite talk show hosts. I thoroughly enjoy watching the guy's show. And you look at the other, the shows like Bill Burr, you know, the comedians like that, where you just can sit down and just revel in, in the humor. Yeah, maybe it's not politically correct, but certainly it's funny. And, you know, if you realize it crosses back and forth across that border all day long, you know, he's but he doesn't have any mean bone in his, bones in his body. He's not trying to hurt anyone. He's not trying to to make a dollar at somebody else's expense, he's just you know pointing out some of the idiosyncrasies in life. But at the same time, he is doing the same thing as someone who is trying to make a dollar off other people, who is trying to hurt somebody else. He's just got a certain personality and a certain attitude and a certain timing and a certain subject matter filter that comes across and comes across in a friendly manner. I don't like Ellen. I think Ellen is vapid, but at the same time, she's extremely polite and extremely easy for a politically correct person to watch. Oprah, probably the same thing. I hardly have ever watched Oprah. And these shows are just too, too correct, too bland. But does that make them good shows? Does that make them bad shows? Does it make them interesting? Does it make them not? These are all personal decisions. But here's the problem. Here's the problem, okay? I think that Spencer has nothing to say. I really do think that he has nothing to say that is interesting, that would catch my attention or most of society's attention if he wasn't promoting essentially ethnic cleansing in the United States. And, and there's no way around that. That is what he's promoting, okay? He, he also is promoting some of the other ideas that he wants to say, oh, I, I want to come out in favor of white people. Um, I want to talk about how great, you know, white culture has been for America. And, you know, 
any idea that you know, you know America won't be a great country as long as there are non-whites in the country, there's, there's a certain degree of simple-mindedness in that, that I think he goes through his day literally like so many racists and bigots do, ignoring the facts that point out how ridiculous that statement is. Just ignoring it. And I think this is where he has his strength. His followers have their strength as much as the seriousness of what they espouse as a solution to make America great again, okay? They are ignoring the facts that show them to be wrong, or at least they're strong counter arguments, okay? All while asking people to look at the facts that support their argument. And this is, this is where I think he is so hard to take. Not, not I'm not saying he's hard to take seriously, but just so hard to want to listen to for me, okay? Because he consistently asks the listener to look at only what he wants to say and nothing else, and to take what he wants to say seriously, but not criticize it, not, not examine it critically. And that is a huge ask, I think, for the intellectual, which he, has, which he claims to be and which, it, which he claims is what he's doing, is being an intellectual about it. He is essentially a long-running fart joke in the middle of a theater, okay, that asks people to not get upset that he's farting and not throw him out of the theater for it. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it on that note, okay? Don't listen to what I say about what Richard Spencer says is wrong or my account. I'm not going to even try to make a counter argument about him. I simply say this. Can you listen to this man for more than a few seconds, for more than a few minutes? How much time would you spend listening to Richard Spencer versus listening to somebody else like Craig Ferguson or Bill Barr or something like that, you know, or Steve Carell or anyone else, you know? If, if you enjoy what he has to say, that says something about who you are as much as your taste. If you can listen to this guy talk for an hour, that's a statement. I personally feel like I can barely listen to the guy for more than 10 seconds. Not because I'm personally offended at what he says, but because what he says is it just jars with my intellect. It really does. It, it, I, he can hardly issue a sentence that I can listen to him say and say, I find that credible. It, 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 it's believable. It's credible. It, it passes the smell test. It passes the, the test of logical examination. Okay. There's very little that I've ever heard him say or read him that he's written or read a quote of him that I've ever said, I want to listen to this guy. I find it intellectually pleasing and I don't have a problem with what he's saying. I don't have a, it isn't, it isn't just literally grating against my sense of intellect and logic and facts. Okay, I completely understand that may not be the case. In fact, the opposite might be the case for a lot of people. But if you want to talk about the dichotomy between the liberals and the conservatives in this country, between the GOP and the Democrats in this country, between the average person of the middle class and the upper class or wealthy or business class, whatever you want to call it, okay, I see Richard Spencer as the pure essence of white racism distilled to almost 100%. And if the GOP doesn't make sense to you, you're gonna find Richard Spencer to be almost straight acid, just straight fucking acid, okay? But if the Democrats don't make sense to you, Richard Spencer is gonna be like pure opium to you, okay? But it's pretty simple to me and pretty obvious that there are plenty of people on hooked on opium in this country Plenty of people hooked on acid, plenty of people hooked on alcohol. There are a lot of different drugs going on in this, in this country. A lot of people on different drugs that are addicts suffering from addiction in many, many, many ways, many different ways, ranging from religion to 
child sex, you know, to forcible sodomy of animals, you know, things like there's all kinds of people out there hooked on all kinds of shit. Okay. I don't think he's really any different in that sense. Okay. I am sure that there are a lot of Democrats out there who would just fucking drive me to tears if I listened to what they were saying. Okay. Richard Spencer is no different in my opinion. Just because he's a racist doesn't mean that he's saying anything new. He may be putting a moderate spin on it. He may be coming at it from a different, slightly different angle than, oh, let's just get rid of all the niggers. All the niggers have a problem in this country. All along. We had known that all along. As soon as they came in, you knew those things were going to go to shit. You know, look, he may be putting a, a, an intellectual spin on that argument, but in my opinion, it's the same argument. Okay. If you look at Europe and want to seriously believe that the United States is an expression of white European history. And yet there are so many problems in this country that are all because we are multicultural or we have, you know, had minorities in this country. In my opinion, you are a complete psychopath, delusional fool who has no desire to take a hard look a truly hard look at American history, okay? But there are a lot of people like that in this country, okay? And this, to me, smacks of nothing different than the gun issue, uh, the issue of um, violence, vigilantism. There's a lot of issues like this in this country where you have people who just have an opinion which runs contrary to science, reason, and logic, okay? But in their opinion, that's why we're having problems, you know? And, you know, because we don't, because liberals and political correct people, politically correct people have taken us far away from the fundamental values of the American country that made us great. You know, it's, it's look, you know, seriously, we did not have a great country, okay? That is the big issue that people are having a real issue over. That's the real disagreement is, has this country ever really been great? And if so, when? And if so, what was it like when it was great? <laughs> you know, and, and, and how do you actually differentiate between the influences of white people, whatever that means, Europeans, you know, minorities of all different, you know, types. I mean, remember there was a time when the Irish were minorities and nobody wanted the Irish in the country. Remember there was a time when the Italians were minority. Nobody, nobody wanted the Italians in the country. Blacks were in the United States long before the, you know, the long, the big Italian and, and Irish uh, immigrations into the country. Uh, American Indians were in this country long before white settlers came. You know, it, there's, and, and, and a lot of the white settlers wouldn't have, wouldn't, the white settlers wouldn't have made it if it weren't for their interactions for the Indians. Okay. Um, you know, there, there are things where every culture has contributed to this society, okay, that we have right now, but, and I'm not saying that this is what he's saying. What I'm saying is, but to take one part and try to give credit for who we are and where we are to that one part while blaming all the other problems on the other parts is simply crazy. It simply denies our history, okay? While at the same time claiming that we were a great country, we are a great country if you take out these other parts out. That's, that's simple insanity, okay? And I do not argue one bit in the slightest that there are a lot of people who believe that, but I cannot see how these people can be taken at all intellectually seriously. It simply denies our history to say that. It denies our culture to say that. And it leaves me at the point where when you hear people talk about the United States, so if you don't love our country, then leave. You hear all these people talking that. Why aren't they saying that to themselves? Why is it that they're telling other people, if you don't love the United States, then leave? Why aren't they saying it to themselves? Well, maybe we should leave and go back to Europe. Why is it that they're always telling other people to leave? Because they don't want to face the facts. They have a simple-minded relationship 
between themselves and history. They are not the problem, everybody else is. They are great, everybody else is a problem. They are wonderful people, everybody else is shit. It's, it's this time, and, and, and especially when I hear him saying that he's an identitarian, okay, they, they, they don't think of themselves as individuals, they think of themselves as a culture because they would rather think of themselves as a culture than an individual. Because they think they can hide behind this bastion of whiteness, okay? And that whiteness is beyond reproach. And look, I'm sorry, but if you honestly think that whiteness is beyond reproach, you are psychotic. There's no question about it. That is, a, that is almost a wonderful and perfect explanation of exactly what the problem is with white people, okay? That they always think that everything they do is great and they never do anything wrong. That they're almost perfect for our society and for our planet that if they wanna do something, it must be a great thing and if somebody disagrees with them, they're a problem. That is almost exactly what has been wrong traditionally with European centralism, okay? No one, even Europeans don't think that, okay? Nobody thinks that but white Americans, nobody. It's just crazy. It is like quite seriously, like the man has no idea that before the United States was in existence, you had so many people from different countries here in the United States to make the white race, okay? That we had Europeans, and there were 50 different countries in Europe, just like there are in Asia, in the Middle East, and so forth. Everyone was from a different country, even people in different towns used to complain and point fingers at other people in, from, a, from a different town. Even in the same town, it was like Protestant versus Catholic, right? Um, Ulsters versus Republican, whatever. This is in Ireland. England, you had um, Anglicans versus Catholics and Protestants and, and, um, and Calvinists and, and uh, Martin Lutherans and all kinds of stuff. Remember, all these people left England to come to the United States, not just because they wanted to, but a lot of them left because they had no choice. Just like you see some people living in Somalia that come to this country, just like you see some people come from Syria live in this country. They didn't all come to Germany because they thought Germany was a great place to be. A lot of them are migrating you know, to Europe because they think it's safe there for their families. Whereas if they were still in Syria, they would be slaughtered. And, and a lot of them were slaughtered. You didn't have people going to Australia. I mean, it's like you could go on and on and on and on. You, there have been 3,500 years at least of recorded history of people fighting wars, slaughtering each other by the hundreds, the thousands, and the hundreds of thousands between people who live across the lake, okay? The Carthinians versus, you know, the whatever, you know, the, the Theresians or whatever. You know, the, it, 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 it's gone on through the history of mankind. Mr. Spencer and his clowns want to roll it all up into one ball of white people versus everybody else, versus what? The Latinos, the blacks, I mean, what else? The, the, um, the Islamics, all the American Indians, Asians, six, that's it. Wrap up the, the entirety of human history into six groups in the United States. Like nothing else ever happened except the good stuff that they brought from Europe. Nothing else. The guy is a fucking psycho, honestly. But the problem, and I, I say this again, the problem is we have a lot of self-centered, narrow-minded psychos in this country just like him. And the good thing about him, the one good thing about this guy is he is shining a light on them and he is telling us where they are. And that they are here. And it's not just our imagination. They're here and they're proud of it. Okay? They're no longer hiding in the shadows, you know, wearing robes, walking around carrying, you know, pitchforks and, and, and holding fires and riding horses at night. No, they're, they're no longer walking on the street, you know, talking about just, you know, that's how Irish, that's, you know, the natural order of mankind, you know, it's no longer, you know, you know, guys sitting in some smoky filled room, you know, wearing tweeds, you know, discussing 
um, how the English should rule the rest of the, the world, or maybe it's the Spanish, or maybe it's the French, I'm not sure, or the Germans, or the Italians, or, or the Russians, or we're not sure which one it should be. No, we're, we're sure, okay, if you identify with the alt-right, if Rush Limbaugh is a, you know, a, a guiding light to you, these kind of things, you know, Sean Hannity, the Fox News Network, all these guys, we know, okay, they're there. There's no hiding from it. There's no denying it. We know they're there. And the one good thing about all of this is they can't deny it either. They can't deny it and be proud to be part of that movement at the same time. Harvey Weinstein and those people, the ones that scuttle in the dark, one person at a time in an isolated room, you know, like a dark kitchen or their hotel room or something like that, that's a different story, okay? The guys that show up at the University of Florida speech and sit in the front row wearing white shirts with fashy haircuts, okay? There's no hiding for these people. And their pride should be our warning, okay? It should be our warning. Just as the fact that there were all these Nazi sympathizers and followers of Adolf Hitler walking around in 1939 with jackboots and, and brown shirts and stuff should have been a warning. I think it was a warning. It was a good warning to a lot of the world, okay? And at that time, believe me, at that time, a lot of the United States was very much like them. You know, Nazi, the Nazis in, 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 in pre-World War II Germany were not exactly, you know, you know, hated in the United States, okay? Um, you know, they, they had a lot of support in the United States. Taking the fact that you're going to, you know, argue for the total extermination of the Jews out of the equation doesn't change that. You know, making Jews white people all of a sudden now and trying to bring the Jews into your umbrella doesn't change that. The, 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 the nonsense arguments are still nonsense arguments. It doesn't matter if you change the argument. They're still nonsense. That's the whole issue here. 